Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, I've been listening all afternoon and um, some really good content, so I'm hoping I can add just a little bit. And I recognize we're um, just a little behind schedule, so I'll, I'll hit on the high points and then we can go over questions in the breakouts as needed. If you guys can go to the next slide. Apologies that I'm not able to drive myself the slides today. So I'm representing uh, MISO, the grid operator in the uh, center of the country, Mid-Continent Independent System Operator. We run the grid and keep the lights on uh, for 15, state, uh, 15 states throughout the center of the country uh, and the Canadian province of Manitoba. And um, I've just got a couple of highlights here. It is a very large grid um, and we are part of the Eastern Interconnect as well. So we are um, a, a subset of a much, even a much a larger grid. So when Debbie was talking earlier about the benefits of um, diversity, geographic diversity. We definitely have that and experience that um, both within MISO and across the uh, Eastern Interconnect, and I'll talk more about that. So we are about 130,000 megawatt system peak, um, and of that at this point, uh, since the focus today is on renewables, um, of that about 20,000 peak uh, comes from, 21,000 now comes from wind, and we have almost 26,000 megawatts of wind installed um, throughout our service territory. Let's go to the next slide. So just to tell a little bit of the story and uh, I'll continue the, the story. Um, what I'm gonna focus on today uh, is I'm gonna talk about forecasting and how we do forecasting and uh, focusing on wind forecasting and how that fits into our processes. I'm also gonna talk about um, some of the things that we've done, some of the market products we've added and some of the modeling that we've done to enable um, specifically wind and now solar um, to integrate into our grid. But first I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we see things changing because we think um, a lot more change is going to be needed in the future. So this chart shows um, basically my uh, tenure with MISO. I joined in very early 2007 when we had 2,500 megawatts of wind on our system. And you can see today, it's, it's kind of been marching up with uh, just a couple hiccups throughout the years, but marching up and we're now at 25.7. And we expect that to continue um, through, the, through the near future. Next slide. So the Midwest is the, um, they, I, I've heard it referred to as the Saudi Arabia of wind. Um, so we have had quite a bit of wind penetration. Solar is uh, coming now. So you can see that uh, the grid currently doesn't have quite, doesn't have a lot of solar, but that is starting to really change. And you can see that change um, coming into play this year as we are integrating um, close to 2,500 megawatts um, of new solar uh, in 2021 alone. And if we looked forward into the future, um, you know, it's, it's always, the next couple of years are difficult because we have, um, we have an interconnection queue process where all of our participants line up, they queue up to register new resources. We have 100,000 megawatts in that queue and 60,000 of those megawatts are solar. Um, another 20,000 are um, wind. Now, not all of that is gonna to come to fruition and that's where the difficulty is. Uh, some of those are speculative. Some of those won't uh, win interconnection service. Some of those, the interconnection service will be too expensive, but it gives you a sense of what we're looking at. We're looking at a lot of solar coming in the near future. Next slide. Um, a picture of how this, how this uh, wind and solar looks today. Uh, throughout our footprint. And you can see that, um, and again, geographic diversity. While it may seem like there's uh, less geographic diversity, every bit helps. So if you can imagine um, the geographic diversity differences between a California grid, um, where you have a much uh, narrower east-west band than you do a north-south band, versus this um, band of energy um, throughout the mid-continent of, the, of uh, the United States. So we, have, we do have quite a bit of diversity. Um, one of the, one of the uh, concerns in a large uh, heavy wind fleet is as the change in wind travels across the, the territory that you're thinking about, the territory that has the wind. And as that change in wind travels across, if you have that wind typically travels east to west, sorry, west to east, 
So if you have a narrower west to east band, it's going to take less time for those changes in wind to travel across that band. So what we're looking at here is, you know, a, a eight statewide region where changes are traveling across the, ba the band. Again, diversity really helps. Um, if we were to add on the 100,000 megawatts of solar, uh, of solar and wind in our queue, it would really represent an even broader distribution because solar in our queue is uh, very well spread around our entire footprint. The wind is in the north and central regions of our footprint, but remember we have a south region and uh, quite a bit of that solar is going to be located in the south and it's gonna be spread all around our footprint. Next slide. Um, we, one of the earlier speakers, uh, Aiden, I believe, talked about probabilistic or stochastic versus deterministic. And I'm going to have a slide that talks about one of the products that we've introduced, and I'm gonna go into a little more detail here, but I just wanted to mention it um, right now. Um, one of the studies that we've been working on is called the Renewable Integration Impact Assessment, and it's kind of written there at the bottom. And if you uh, Google that, you can, you can look up RIA, R-I-I-A, Renewable Integration Impact Assessment. And what we've done is studied what a uh, renewable portfolio um, looks like as it crosses through 10%, 20%, 30%, all the way up toward 100% of uh, penetration levels. And what are the impacts to reliability? So MISO's role as the system operator um, we're a member services organization. Our job is to, our members have entrusted us to provide reliability services for their customers. And so what we're focused on is what those reliability needs are going to be 10 years from now, 15 years from now, 20 years from now, as, as the renewable portfolio, as renewable penetration expands. And one of the takeaways that we have is that variability obviously is going to get much, much greater. So if you just kind of look at these, this, these charts and you see the, the error bars, you know, the, bar, the, the solid bars of where there's a strong expectation, even those are kind of spreading apart a little bit, but then the outliers, the outliers are getting farther and farther away from the center. And uh, this is MISO's specific system here. So when you're at a 40% penetration level, you have error bars that are 20,000 megawatts on either side. Um, so you have specific uh, one-off scenarios where you can expect to see a 20,000 megawatt um, uncertainty or variability occurrence on your system. Um, that, that's not something we can take lightly. Next slide. So um, before I kind of come back to the present and talk about how we, um, the market products that we currently have and the forecasting that we currently do, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we call the reliability imperative. And um, it, it, the prior slide is just kind of one snapshot of a number of different things that have led us um, to describing the future state of the grid as a reliability imperative. Um, we need to be working, talking about it, we're doing what we're doing now, and working to prepare the grid for the future that is going to be upon us uh, soon enough. And we think about that in terms of um, three parts. The first one is market redefinition. And um, I, I think as I listened to the speakers today, I heard a lot of examples of market redefinition. And market redefinition can be on the retail side, it can be time of use pricing. Um, and I heard examples uh, on the market operator side, the wholesale side where we operate of new, new products, whether they be uh, frequency response products, um, other kinds of the, uh, the, the image where um, energy typically today is 80% of what the market is focused on and those ancillary services represent just that last 20% and then moving to the future where energy is a much smaller piece of the pie and an ancillary services pick up and are much more important and much more necessary. This is what we're talking about when we talk about market redefinition. Um, we have already put in place some of the products and services that have helped us get to where we are, you know, the low hanging fruit. Um, some of the decisions and some of the things we're wrestling with going forward are going to need to be bigger. Um, incrementalism probably isn't going to work this time. So uh, one of the first things that we have already been working on is what we call the market system enhancement. This is the second leg of our stool and uh, that is an effort to redesign both our hardware and our software systems 
to be able to um, uh, prepare, to be able to integrate those markets that we're going to need. Um, we have been operating the same uh, market software, not the hardware, but the same market software um, for most of my tenure at MISO, we, we launched the, the energy and ancillary service markets that we're using today. We did that in 2009. And uh, at the point in time we launched them, that they had already been in use by another system operator. So th those softwares date back to the maybe the mid to late 90s. Soon after order 888 is when they were um, invented. So those designs are, you know, a little out of date if you're using software from the 90s, um, specifically from a security perspective. Um, from a scalability perspective, the algorithms may not necessarily be out of date, but certainly all of the accompanying software that enables the markets to run uh, could stand for an update. So we have been focusing on uh, for the last three or four years and are continuing to focus through until we get through this, uh, a, a complete redesign. So we'll have a system that we can much more easily bolt on um, new additions as they come. And then lastly, and certainly not least, is uh, long-range transmission planning. And I heard Debbie, uh, one of Debbie's conclusions was that transmission is our friend. Um, the, mid, the center of the country is uh, in a great place because we are an interconnected grid. We have strong ties across neighboring seams. Um, those ties are already being challenged and, and those uh, transfers are already being challenged by the level of penetration of renewables that we have we're starting to see uh, more and more difficulty for resources to interconnect because there's just not transmission to carry the energy where it wants to go. Uh, so long range transmission planning is the third leg of that stool, um, a coordinated effort to deliver the transmission system that we're going to need to manage this grid that we're talking about in the future. Moving on to the next slide. And recognizing that I should probably take just about four more minutes. Um, so let me touch the, the high Mark, points of this. Mark, it's okay for you to go over. It's okay. We'll just, um, yeah, we'll just extend it to what you need because it's fine. Okay, Debbie. Um, so this is the slide that talks about one of the products that we've implemented already. So um, ancillary services have been discussed. We talked uh, today about regulating reserve, which is that moment to moment reserve that's needed. We talked about spinning reserve, I think. Uh, this is another ramp product that we've had um, for five or more years now, maybe maybe as long as seven years. Um, and this is the one where we tried to foresee the need before the need was upon us. Uh, because a lot of times um, it's, it's hard to foresee those needs and, and grid operators often find themselves playing catch up. Uh, we're trying not to do that anymore. And this was our, one of our first examples. This is also the example where we talk about determinism versus uh, probabilistic. And, and I know a lot of people aren't mathy and sciencey people. Um, and so hopefully a picture might help. This is a picture of our five minute dispatch process. So you have these five minute time scales down at the bottom and we're focused on two times in particular, 810 and 820. And our algorithm is extremely deterministic. All of, the, all of the different forecasts, all of the different variability, all of the different uncertainty are all incorporated into a math problem that assumes no uncertainty and no variability. This is the way it's gonna be 10 minutes from now. And it solves the problem based on all of the guesses, assumptions, forecasts that we put in, uh, but then it assumes that they're all exactly what's going to happen. That's, that's what deterministic means. Uh, and that's what, that's what the markets use. So uh, right now at 810, in this example, we're calculating a, a set of solutions for 820. And then we will send those dispatches to our generators. We'll send them at 815, everything takes time. So it is a five minute process, but we're always looking ahead 10 minutes to do it. What the ramp capability product does is create these cones. So it's an effort to try to create a probabilistic view within a deterministic process. So we have a specific requirement to, to keep, to reserve back uh, an excess, uh, an, an, an available amount of ramping capability so that we can hit any spot within that cone. And then that's for obvious reasons. I've seen lots of charts today that show the variability that's happening because of wind and solar. Um, and this, uh, this flexibility that we are building in, we build it in every five minutes and it's always make, made available for a 10 minute stretch and we can deploy it when we need to, when the, uh, the wind capability or the load capability is falling far outside that deterministic view. So it's a market-based approach. Um, it's a systematic approach to pre-position resources. And um, really it's a, it's a way to 
intentionally incur a little bit of cost in an effort to save more money over the long run by reducing price spikes and volatility in our market. Moving on. To the next slide, thank you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about our uh, dispatchable intermittent resources, which um, I think is kind of old news now. Um, we introduced it in 2011. At the time, it was a novel um, concept in system operations, um, but has, uh, I think, widely been used at least uh, through parts of the United States uh, where five-minute dispatches are utilized to integrate wind and solar into the footprint. And, you know, you talk about a, a set of um, market software, market algorithms that were designed for a, a different time. Um, markets, our market algorithms basically ignored the wind resources that we had in place. And that was fine when we had less than 500 megawatts of wind resources on a 120,000 megawatt peak system. But once we started seeing considerable wind penetration, and the wind was um, trying to produce energy and causing congestion. All, all energy producers cause congestion. We're not singling out wind here. But as congestion happened and our market did, was not aware of it, we were seeing um, out, uh, bad market outcomes and our operators were needing to work around it. Um, whenever we don't have a market solution, in, in, the, in any of these system operations conditions, whenever you don't have a market solution, your operators are tasked with doing that. And um, if we think to the future, if we think to DERs, if we think to widespread distributed resources, it's not going to be fair to our operators to be um, forced to, to be requiring them to be making manual operations. So we had a taste of this in 2008, 2009, when our operators were making hundreds of phone calls a day and that's why we introduced DIRs, which is a pretty simple solution. It basically um, found the, the question that we answered was, how could you make wind look like all of the other resources in the software? What would you need to do in the software to make wind able to participate? And we found um, that we, need to make, we only need to make a couple of small changes to, to make that happen. Um, so we have slowly been moving toward getting all of our wind and solar registered as DIRs dispatchable intermittent resources, and uh, moving forward, all of our solar and wind as they interconnect will be dispatchable. Um, next slide. So I've spoken a lot about a little, a little bit of this, um, a couple of the most important parts. Um, I said that we tried to do as little as we could to make these resources look just like all of the other resources. And the primary difference is with a wind resource and, and now a solar resource, I, I speak of wind um, more than solar, which is different than the rest of the presenters today because we have a lot more wind than solar, but that's gonna be changing maybe in the next five years, uh, maybe as soon as that. Um, the thing that's different is you're not sure what it's gonna be capable of. And the longer you wait, the better you're going to have an idea of what it's going to be capable of. So we allow their, um, their five-minute forecast, which they can provide uh, almost right up till the last moment when we're about to run our software. Um, that becomes the, the limit that we use within our uh, market algorithm. Um, we have our, our participants can create their own forecast and provide it. However, MISO also creates a forecast for each of our resources. Uh, we prioritize that from the very beginning. Um, and more than 90% of our participants use the MISO forecast um, in order to uh, dispatch their resources. What that means is our forecast needs to be good. Um, we have a determinant, like I said, we have a deterministic software, which means that the limit, the maximum limit of each of these wind, for, uh, wind resources becomes uh, a limit that we will dispatch to because, you know, because wind is so cheap, unless it's being constrained because of congestion, we're going to try to have all these resources at the top so that what the top is becomes very important and how well we're forecasting what the top is every five minutes throughout the day is very important. Next slide. Um, so let me back up just a minute before I go into detail on forecast. This is where we use our forecasts. Um, we have a, a medium term load and renewable forecast and a short term load and renewable forecast that we use. And um, our forward process, uh, 
we have a forward process that does commit resources for long lead times greater than 16 hours and that's when we're making decisions that one often does not come into play but in situations like the winter event that we just went through that becomes a very important process especially since the monday of that winter event was a holiday and um, gas markets are closed on holidays and so gas purchases were all happening on friday so our participants are trying to determine what the right amount of gas to buy is and our operators are trying to determine whether or not uh, these different long lead time resources will need to be online that and of course how much wind we have available is going to is going to very much come into play in that question so that's what we use that forward commitment process for and then on an ongoing basis throughout the day we have an intraday commitment process that's looking ahead focusing on four hours from now all the time four hours from now but that four to 16 hour window looking at the load forecast looking at the renewable forecast and making uh, commitments additional resource commitments as needed based on those forecasts and that goes all the way down to the five minute uh, market that i talked about where our short-term um, renewable and load forecasts ultimately become entry points to the determinist deterministic algorithm where whatever the forecast is with five minutes to go becomes the the uh, product the, in in terms of the load that's how much load we are targeting to buy and in terms of the renewable forecasts each of those um, wind farms that's going to be how much they have available to offer next slide and I will and I will wrap up here at let's actually uh, skip this slide since since I talked about this a little bit already um, and skip this slide too okay so what goes into our renewable forecasts um, quite a bit of information um, I think somebody talked about cameras um, and we don't have cameras yet, uh, not quite as important uh, for wind farms, uh, but I found that interesting. So maybe that'll be a data point in the future where we have cameras on um, solar collectors. Um, but we have some of the, the non-changing information, operational characteristics, which I'll come back to, uh, longitude, latitude, which helps um, form the weather prediction, and then the basic information about each wind farm. And then um, what's going into that, on a on a periodic and frequent updating basis is the numerical weather prediction which is um, you know basically uh, taking the live atmospheric data and creating a prediction about what the wind patterns are going to be for the next five minutes the next hour the next 16 hours and then that uh, uh, live data as well um, from wind sites wind speed from wind sites is going into the um, a set of models that we have and producing a forecast next slide Um, we have uh, forecasts that are happening every uh, and they're updating every hour and they are building off of past success and past failures so you can see here an example of how uh, the actual wind is the black line and we have a series of wind forecasts that are being made prior to one hour two hours three hours and four hours prior and they are updating and trying to correct for uh, what is actually happening. So what we see, the blue line is the oldest one, and the blue line is predicting that the energy is gonna drop off, but it missed the peak. And so as the peak is crossing through, uh, as the actual energy is crossing through and preparing to cross through, the forecast is updating and trying to capture um, what it thinks the new peak is going to be. Next slide. Um, switching gears a little bit, that was a, a forecast tool on our broader forecast. And we also have, like I said, a forecast for each of the wind farms um, in our footprint. And market participants do not have to use our forecast. We use our forecast for certain processes. Our market participants don't have to use our forecast, but 90% of them do. Um, and we have um, monitoring and reporting on how those how each of those forecasts are doing so here you're looking at a single wind farm and you're looking at uh, forecast air and as it grows there for a certain time period that's going to kick off um, a monitoring uh, alarm for our forecast operators to adjust and to uh, look into next slide Um, and let me finish it up here and then uh, trying to c catch us up uh, just a little bit. 
Um, I talked about the specific operational conditions, and this um, has become important in the news lately. Um, for MISO, this, this was an issue a few years ago where we had a severe winter event, a very, very cold winter in the northern portion of uh, MISO and did have some significant wind cutouts. And after that time, um, that put an emphasis on our part on um, making sure we have an understanding of all of the wind farms and the characteristics of all of the wind farms in our footprint. And that includes um, when you could expect turbinizing, uh, when you could expect a high speed cutout, um, are there high or low temperature turbine cutouts? Um, uh, those are some of the things that are specific to each wind farm and uh, we are now tracking and that goes into our both our long and short term forecasts. A couple of other things that we think about um, and this is just kind of to leave you with something to think about for the long term. Um, a couple years back we had a 72 hour period where there was zero wind production. The wind basically stopped. So low to negative production periods. Um, the sun did go down three times during that 72 hour period. So um, we are going to have to think about other ways to manage some of these extreme scenarios. You think about a 100-year drought or a 100-year flood. Well, we will also have to be thinking about a 100-year um, wind, low wind event and a 100-year cloudy event. Uh, having grown up in Michigan, um, that felt like every day to me. Uh, but those are some of the things that we're going to have to think about moving forward. Um, that concludes my presentation. And again, appreciate, appreciate being here and looking forward to the chat.